My name is Leo Shoemaker for Adventures with Leo Shoemaker. I'm here at the Meadowdale High School Auto Class in Edmonds, Washington. We're going to go in and talk to everybody about what they do here, what they're going to learn, talk to the teacher, what kind of program he has, and I'm pretty excited about this. My name is Leo Shoemaker, your host of Adventures with Leo Shoemaker on Channel 10, BTV, and on YouTube at Adventures with Leo Shoemaker. Thank you. Brian Robbins is the auto teacher here at Meadowdale High School, but you have other high schools come over, correct? Yeah, we're actually called the, uh, the Edmonds School District Automotive Training Center, um, and if anyone in the Edmonds School District wants to take a, an auto shop class, they hop on the bus and come over to us and we train them and then they head back to their home school. What made you start thinking about being a teacher for auto shop? Were you into cars when you were a kid? Uh, yeah, that's a... Uh, an interesting story and question there. Uh, my dad was the auto shop teacher here before me. Really? And he uh, uh, he got sick back in 2007, um, and I quit my job. I was working over at Jim Green's Performance Center, um, and ended up. Uh, and put my job there and I came here and they just handed me a teaching certificate, an emergency teaching certificate and I took over training uh, the students for the second half of that school year and I've been around ever since. What is your dad's name? Uh, Dave Robbins. Excellent. Uh, and did he tell you you'd probably take this over? No, no, we never had any thought in our heads. Like I was gonna, I was working on uh, being a pit crewman uh, on Top Fuel Funny Cars at the time. Really? Uh, yeah, I was working at, at Green's Performance Center, and I got a, a job with uh, Bob Gilbertson's uh, uh, Funny Car Team and uh, their Trick Tank Racing Team, and uh, it was just kind of in that off time where this all happened, and and yeah, it's been it's been a ride. Tell us what a top fuel dragster is. So these are the cars that are 10,000 horsepower, uh, uh, 500 cubic inch Hemi engines. Uh, they've got uh, dual magneto ignition systems, uh, so two spark plugs per cylinder. They run on nitromethane. Um, have a giant 1471 blower on the things, and um, these are cars that are doing you know four second quarter miles, over 300 miles per hour. I was talking to Trevor about nitro. Can you tell us what exactly is in nitro? Uh, like nitro methane is a self-oxidizing fuel source. So as it combusts, it actually produces its own oxygen molecule, uh, which to, to hit a stoichiometric ratio, you get to burn more of it because as it burns, it makes more oxygen and allows you to burn more. Uh, and so uh, it's like being able to burn gasoline with nitrous oxide uh, without having the extra components in there. Excellent. Good explanation. <laughs> Do you miss uh, the drag racing? I still do drag race. Do I, uh, okay. Yeah, I'm uh, at an amateur level. I run the NHRA tracks. Um, I've got a, a 27 Model T uh, replica that, that runs in the uh, nine second range, and then uh, I got an eight second rear engine dragster uh, as well. And, kind of a trade-off on which one I'll run that year. And do you have names for the cars? Like there used to be Pure Hell, there used to be all these other cars? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the dragster's name is Barney. Um, and it's because uh, it's, it's purple. It has a nice little motif of Barney on the front of it with a nice little noose around its neck because you gotta, you got to have your fun with it. Yeah. Uh, the unfortunate name of the, the Roadster is it's a, a bright red Roadster and it's called Red Light Robins. Oh, that's not uh, good. <laughs> and tell us what a red light is. Uh, that's when you leave before the, the starting line tree activates. Uh, we're trying to, to cut as close as you can to the light turns green. And if you leave before that, that green bulb comes on, uh, even if it's by a thousandth of a, a, thousandth of a second, then you end up uh, turning on that, that red light. And I call them pink. Uh, you know, they're, they're just a little red, but just <laughs> enough. Have you red lighted yet? Oh, man, I, uh, yeah, no, it's, I, I run right on the ragged edge there. Yeah? Uh, yeah, and it's, and so, uh, it's, 
It is always a thrill to uh, to leave the line and see that the light was green and that I actually get to try and run down the other car uh, instead of finding out that you lost on the starting line. If you leave early but not red light, they call it a hole shot, correct? If you leave before the other car um, and then the other car never led during the race, that'd be a hole shot. Excellent. Where do you race at? Uh, race uh, mainly over at Bremerton Raceway. Uh -huh. um, that's uh, been my favorite track for forever. Um, I race over at uh, Pacific Raceways. Uh, sometimes, uh, uh, sometimes I make it down to a Woodburn Drag Strip, and then I don't have my, the the enhanced special license yet, so I haven't been up to, to Mission Raceway over in BC for a number of years now. Excellent. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, you're welcome. Welcome, Trevor. Here at the Meadow. Dale High School, correct? Are you, you go to school here? Yes, I do. Now you've got a nice engine right here. Uh, what is it? Uh, 396 big block Chevy. Excellent. Were they called rat motors? Was that a 427? I'm not sure about that. Okay. So what made you work on this project, Trevor? Uh, well, this was just the biggest engine and I got first dips. <laughs> Have you worked in an engine this big before? Uh, not quite this big. I've done a couple like the ones you'll see, but not nothing of this size. And you like Chevrolet? I do. I am a Why? Chevy guy. Grew up, grew up in a Chevy family. Uh huh. What did your dad? Was your dad a mechanic? Uh, he's a diesel mechanic. Yes. Uh huh. Oh, good. That's the best. Mm -hmm. Wow. Because you learn everything from him, right? Right. How about your other brothers and sisters? Do they work in anything? Uh, uncles and my cousin is just getting into the diesel field. What are you gonna do with this engine? Well, we're gonna run it on the stand and then hopefully put it in one of these Model Ts and uh, run that in there, be able to Double turn start. key. Excellent. And are you going to race it? Uh, burnout. Maybe race. Okay, burnout. Great. Maybe, okay. if, maybe if Mr. Robbins will let us. That'd be fun to go to the, the uh, Puyallup uh, cars. Uh, what's it called? Anyway, there's a car show there. And you do burnouts there. Wonderful to watch. So Trevor, what else are you going to do with the engine? Well, I'm putting on the headers right now and then uh, figure out Spark plug wires, and we're going to carburetor this one. The other ones have fuel injection. And what kind of headers? These ones are, just, I'm not sure what brand they are, but they look like they've been on a race engine. Was this engine donated? Uh, yes, it was. Who gave it you know? Uh, someone who gave up on it because it was blown up, and we got it for free because they, whoever it was, didn't want to deal with it. And when you got it, what was it like? Uh, completely bare, just block parts on the. Uh, that table over there. There was an over. I'll have to go over there, Trevor. Yeah. Check it out. Trevor, here with this 396 Chevy motor. So, Trevor, you have a car right here that you started to work on when you were a freshman? Yes, there were advanced students in my class four years ago that started working on that car. And COVID doesn't, COVID certainly doesn't help when you're trying to get stuff done. And now you're a senior? Yep. You think, you think you'll get it done before you leave? We're hoping so. Good. What kind of uh, uh, fuel will it be? Um, I'm sure uh, Mr. Robin will use pump gas. Okay, not, not nitro then? Not, not nitro, yeah. Sure. Will a turbocharge use nitro? Can they? Oh, yeah. Okay. And tell us what nitro is. Uh, nitro is a uh, type of fuel that is way more combustible than your regular pump gas. It's usually in race cars like dragsters and funny cars, stuff like that. Is it dangerous? Uh, yes. Do you ever go to the drags? All the time. Isn't that yeah. great? Hopefully, we're going to start drag racing this year. Thanks, Trevor. Thank you. So, Trevor, you have some great Model Ts here. What are they? These have been built by students in the past. The one over there is a uh, turbocharged, and this one in the middle is supercharged. This is a project for the end of the year for the advanced students, and uh, it's on a pass or fail grading really? basis. If, it'll, if it does a burnout, you pass. Uh huh. That's how you're graded. This is usually this is our final. Instead of doing book work and stuff, is the, can the car you built do a burnout? And turbocharged, now that's completely different than supercharged. Absolutely. Tell us about it. So turbocharged is runoff exhaust. So that means when the air pushes out used, uh, or when the engine pushes out used air, it spins the turbo and that pushes new air into the intake. It shoves the air into it. Mm -hmm. 
And then supercharger, it just it doesn't have anything to do with exhaust. It just pulls air. It sucks air in instead of a naturally aspirated carburetor, which is a lot not nearly as strong as a turbo. And I see different exhaust pipes on there on yes. the supercharged one. Why? That's because for the turbocharger, you need the exhaust mm -hmm. uh, hooked up to the turbo, so you can use the exhaust for the to spool the turbo up. These ones, you don't. Know, the exhaust doesn't really matter for a supercharger. Yeah, I bet they're noisy. Oh yeah. <laughs> I don't know if this drill, like, I went to do this drill, but, like, this marking, I feel like it's way off. Because I went, I went deep in there, and then I realized I thought I went a little too deep. I would take this. I think it would be okay. Um, it depends. Like, the thickness of the item that you're bolting on is going to have a lot to do with how straight you can get it. The exhaust flange is going to be fairly narrow. Whereas, if you're putting on the cylinder that way, that really has to be perfect. Um, the helical, I can't remember the helical. Put it on there, and then thread it on it. That's it. The big difference that, that I've tried this year, I, I actually got to spend the, the COVID lockdown just thinking about what this place is going to look like. Um, during last school year, we only had classes three hours per day over Zoom. And uh, I thought it was really important for the kids to have some kind of a constant in their life. And so I showed up to work every day at the same time that I normally would. I, I get in at 6.30 in the morning and I leave at that, you know, just after uh, 3 in the afternoon. And part of that was I was worried that I'd become like one of those like sweatpants people that just never got dressed again if I sat around at my house all year. And like a lot of teachers said they loved the, the Zoom thing, roll out of bed, three hours on the computer, roll back into bed. And I decided to keep that up so that the kids would see that there was a constant, that, that no matter what, Robbins is in the auto shop. Like, they, that was something they could hang their hat on. So I uh, did all 180 days of school and broadcast right here from the shop. But being that I only had three hours uh, of computer interaction, it left me with a lot of time to, to go through and go, how can we make this program so that everyone can learn from it. So that everyone can really... Instant. It used to be that this program would really show us who was a really good gearhead, uh, you know, who, who knew their stuff, and it would just be like this this thing to weed out, you know, the kid who was never going to figure out much of Lucy righty tidy from the one who could be a true pet. Uh, and I decided I wanted it to be something that, no, everyone who comes in here is going to leave with this list of skills. And, uh, and so what I came up with was to uh, take a basic vehicle inspection, like a, a multi-point vehicle inspection, and make that the key focus uh, of the very first part of the class, and have everything else branch out from that. Um, and then we set up these stations like what we have going right now, where you know, we got one group over here doing arc welding, one group doing mid welding, one group doing tap and die and helicoil, another group is fabricating brake lines. And then tomorrow, see, they all stay in their little group, and tomorrow uh, their group will move to another station, and then another station. And at the end, I give them a test, and it's just I choose one of the things uh, at random. And the students all come out one at a time, and I go, okay, do this job. And then they show me that uh, when they're practicing, that they understood it and they're able to perform the task. Um, so how about the kids? Do they do they enjoy the work? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the number of students that I've had, especially this year, telling me that this is their favorite class, that this is the only class they've ever had that has given them true skills that they know that they are going to be able to use in real life. Uh, it's We've always had a lot of students say things like that, but now it's across the board uh, of students talking about the worth of, of this class in this place. And we're always looking for mechanics out there in the, in the wor real world because they're becoming rarer and rarer, aren't they? Uh, all the trades are suffering in that way. Um, you know, we've made work a, a dirty four-letter word. And, uh, 
everyone seems to want to hop around on YouTube and, and uh, get money for, you know, I call it being a, like a Pee Wee Herman for the curse a lot, and then you got yourself a YouTube star. Uh, and that seems to be what a lot of the kids are aspiring for, and, and the thought of going in 40 hours a week to do things that but then, you know, you've got to be physically capable and you've got to be mentally capable. And you meet a lot of kids that just want to do the physical side, you know, that, that, you know, carrying around buckets of rocks at a construction site sounds awesome, but sitting in front of a computer sounds horrible. Then you got the other spectrum where they don't want to do anything physical at all, but put them in front of a computer and they're perfectly happy. Automotive is where those two genres, where those, those two places have to meet. Um, and the type of person that, that has the brain and the brawn at the same time, it, that's become very rare. So you have communication skills, so you know what the problem is and how to relate it to someone else, tell them what it is. You have math, uh -huh. and you have strength. That, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Wow. And yeah, students that go through the program actually receive an English credit uh, for their technical writing. Uh, they receive a science credit for all the science principles that we use. Uh, they get career and tech ed credit, and then they also uh, get elective credit and college credit uh, from the program too. It's, uh, it's recognized in our district that this is uh, a program for people that are interested in going into the industry. So it's win-win for the students, and it's something for you to look back on and go, this is what I've done. That's a, that's a great thing. It really is. Like, that's one thing is that I cannot imagine having a career that's more rewarding than the one I have. Um, and it's, it didn't really take a, there wasn't a lot of me that thought about going back into to being on a pit crew or, or uh, you know, to going back into being a technician. And I didn't have any real regrets after I started doing this, although, I will say my first week here was was a bear. Was it? Why? We used to have a, a 2000 Dodge Viper in here, and uh, a student had asked if we could use the scan tool on it. It was parked right outside the bay door over there. You notice that that bay door looks a little bit newer than the other ones. Um, I gave him the keys to the car and told him, hey, do all the scan tool functions, but don't start the car. Don't get any engine running information because I just didn't want him to start up that monster of a car. Well, the next kid wanted to do a scan tool and he wanted to do it on the Viper too. So the kid just handed him over the keys and didn't give the warning. Next kid got to the part of the scan tool form that said, okay, now get all your readings for the engine running. Starts the thing up. Let's his foot off the clutch, didn't realize that it was in gear, and that thing launched forward. You think that you think that uh, you know it killed the engine, but when you got a 10-cylinder, 500 horsepower engine, no, it just went. The pedals were all so close together. He went to jam on the brakes and he hit the gas instead. And it launched through that door. It, it was like a cartoon. It cut a perfect viper-shaped hole uh, in the door. It came barely through here. We were in our welding unit at the time. I had 19 kids all in that one area. Uh, the only student who got injured was uh, uh, the deaf student who wasn't able to hear it come. Um, and luckily somebody else shoved him out of the way, but uh, the car's mirror clipped him on the way by. Um, and yeah, it, it barreled right into this big yellow pole right here and sat there with the wheels just spinning uh, until I ran through and I jumped through the window and turned the car off and looked around like, is everyone okay? We had to go take attendance, make sure there wasn't any people underneath the car or something. And, uh, you know, then had to call in uh, you know, the, the district office and people came to investigate. And uh, yeah, that was that was my third day of being a teacher. It was like, welcome to it. <laughs> Good story. Thank I'm you. glad nobody got hurt really bad. Nope, nope, we, we got through it okay. So, Mr. Robbins, you have a flag here with two special pennants. Tell us about them. So, yeah, uh, during uh, COVID, during the shutdown, uh, they did the entire um, automotive technology competition that they do uh, every year, Skills USA, um, and it was all this remote virtual thing. They sent us uh, 
about twenty thousand dollars worth of tools and equipment uh, that we had to carefully wrap back up and send back to them uh, to do these competitions. Uh, things like uh, electronics trainers uh, and scan tools and oscilloscopes and and all that stuff. And we basically had to. Uh, take it out of the package, like show that it was still in its original package on camera the day of the competition, take it out of the package, and then go through and, and do all these different jobs with those uh, components. So the students were here uh, on campus doing the competition, but not uh, in the big group setting like what we've seen in the past. Um, and uh, we did a really unique training program last year where um, I got funds uh, raised up and, and used our, our program funds as well um, and really just kind of mortgaged ourselves and bought every single student a uh, cobalt toolkit. Um, Did you? A full 300-piece uh, uh, How much did that cost? Kit. It was uh, about $100 per student, so uh -huh. we ended up spending uh, $6,000 to cover uh, all of our students. Um, but everyone got one of those toolkits and everyone got to keep them uh, when they were all done at the end of the year. I knew that I wasn't going to be able to, to actually teach them automotive technology. I knew that we weren't going to provide them with an automotive education, that the kids weren't going to be uh, really better at fixing cars after staring at the computer all year than they were at the beginning of the year. And I figured the least I could do if I couldn't teach them anything would be to, at the very minimum, get them started off with a set of tools. Um, and we did a bunch of these take-home projects. I got, I went to the junkyard and I got brakes off of a whole bunch of cars and the kids would uh, come by and, and pick up these brake assemblies and take them home and then we'd go through, you know, using their toolkit to remove the parts, uh, measure the parts and reassemble everything. Um, we had a, a whole big stockpile from when the auto shop shut down at Mollick Terrace High School of uh, Briggs and Stratton engines. And so they came back with the brake assemblies and gave us the brake assemblies back and then we sent them off with the engines and that was our next month's project. Uh, we made these, these stupid little wire harnesses that were like, a, it was just a PVC tube with five wires cut up uh, to go inside it and uh, I gave them all a resistor as well and they had to uh, cut one of the wires in half, uh, twist two of the wires, you know, take out the insulation, twist two of them together to make a, a short circuit and then one of them they wired in the resistor and then they could take, we got those little five dollar Harbor Freight uh, voltmeters and then they could take and test each one of the wires and show where's the high resistance circuit, where's the short circuit, where's the open circuit and, uh, and they got to show on video, you know, share their screen, here's mine, here's where all those things are. Um, and it was, for, for being a virtual class, it, it was pretty good, and it took a lot of effort. Um, but I didn't realize that the, the reality of it was that I was one of the few auto shop teachers that was still shoving my students forward to try and get them to learn something. And uh, it, it paid off for us because, yeah, we took uh, um, first place in Washington State for automotive service, uh, first place in Washington State uh, for automotive maintenance and light repair, and ended up uh, uh, getting ranked uh, number four in the nation when we went through and did the national uh, competition. That's the first time that, that our school has ever been invited to nationals. Um, and yeah, it was quite the thing to, to be able to do. Now I found out about your program when you sent a letter to my car club, Fourth Corner Elites in Bellingham, Washington, asking for funds. What would the funds be used for? We are trying to, this year we're trying to get our, our auto shop uh, jackets, our club jackets uh, for every one of the students. We're, um, and it's been the thing that we've been trying to do in the past as well, uh, but just provide every student with one of those jackets. Our, carpentry program that runs in a different school, they buy all their students' jackets every year and seem to have no problem with it, but for us, uh, raising funds has become an issue. Uh, we used to, to take in cars from the public, and we would fix them up and sell them, and that's how, and we were one of the richest uh, club programs in the district uh, when we were doing that, and buying this stuff was, was no issue. Um, 
bunch of lawsuits in other states uh, caused our director to contact me and say, absolutely not. We can take in public donated vehicles. We can work on them, fix them up, whatever we're going to do with them. But afterward, uh, they have to go off to the junkyard. We cannot sell those to anyone. Um, and overnight, our funds completely dried up. And uh, we've tried everything. We've, we've sold donuts and seized candies. Uh, we tried to run a car show to and we, we had this whole weird thing set up where uh, you voted for your favorite car in the car show with money. So everyone got an envelope and every car had a number assigned to it. And uh, you could put a penny in there and that was a vote for your favorite car. You just wrote on the envelope what car number it was. Uh, or you could put in a $100 bill if you wanted to. We actually uh, encouraged everyone to you know, go ahead and win this thing. We don't care if it's the Geo Metro in the corner, you know. Put in a couple hundred bucks and win this thing. Um, and uh, what we found is after the cost of, of setting everything up and doing everything else, uh, we usually broke even oh. um, after, uh, and that was a huge amount of effort and time spent. Usually, yeah, we didn't break even. I suppose we made two to three hundred dollars, but at the end of it, I was usually so dead tired that I was like, man, I would pay three hundred dollars not to feel like this right now. <laughs> uh, Have you got any response from other car clubs in the state of Washington? We've gotten a little bit of response um, from a few of them uh, for for doing things like uh, coming in, doing guest speaking, things like that. Funds are are definitely tied everywhere, um, and so it's been uh, one where like people do want to know how they can help out, but typically uh, finances is one place where where people have a. You know, I get it. Everything's tight right now, and uh, and yeah, I don't want anyone to be. Um, you know, not able to, to pay their grocery bill because they tried to help us get some jackets. So how much are you asking for? How much money? Um, it comes out to, right now we're looking for, it's $5,000 to cover everybody, but we've uh, uh, covered the first 2000 of it with our fundraisers uh, that we've done so far. And so we're trying to, to bridge that gap of that last uh, $3,000. Now you talk about jackets. I wear my car club jacket every day. I can't help it. I'm proud of it. And are the students proud of their jackets, the ones in the past? Absolutely. Uh, I still have mine. For, I got mine in uh, the year 1999 uh, when I uh, was first, you know, going through this program myself. Um, and I still I wore that same one to work today. And uh, like you get it all the time, where people out in the public see those things. Even if they didn't take our class, they know exactly where that came from. Um, and they, they're this amazing thing to start this conversation where when you see you know, these roving bands at, you know, up in the lunchroom of you know, 20 or 30 kids all in these same jackets, people start to ask, where does that come from? Why are you guys all in the same jacket? And because we're, we're tucked down in the far corner of the school and there's a lot of students who can go here for four years and never even know the place exists. Um, it's one of my favorite things to do is uh, during the day where they do their practice for graduation, all the seniors will line up uh, right outside the shop there and then march into the gym. And uh, I'll sit out there and listen for how many of them go, why is there a garage attached to the back of the gym? Uh-huh, yeah, it was shop class, you should have taken it. So Mr. Robbins, where would we go to donate funds if, you, if we wanted to donate money to help you out? Yeah, um, you just, uh, I, if you, you're able to do it with a, either cash or check, um, and a check would just be made out to ESC, that's, uh, Edmonds, uh, or ESD, Edmonds School District. Um, and then we can uh, donate it into our, or uh, deposit it into our club fund. Um, and, and yeah, that's it. Is there a, well, should we put something in the memo to make sure it gets to you? Yeah, uh, yeah, no, it definitely you would need to be, uh, you know, care of Brian Robbins. Um, but yeah, in the it just have to be the envelope that it came in. Okay. You have to have my name on it. But the check itself, only write that out to ESD. Um, I feel like anything else could just get too too hard to figure out. They can cash those ones. Do you have a Facebook page or a Instagram page for any of this? Um, I think that the kids just made an Instagram page. We'll have to uh, off. I'll have to figure out what it's called. Send it and, to me. And yeah, I'll send that over to you. <laughs>
Yeah, it's been it's been a blast coming here. It's, it's a flash from the past for me because I was in the auto shop and it really helped me a lot. And I can see the kids, I mean, the students are really interested, and I really enjoy seeing the the aha moment, like you said. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You.